So let's start. Uh, what we're going to be covering this session is about handling data, partly programmatically, partly manually, and I'm going to focus more on the programmatic bits of it. If you take the cycle of data, first you need to get it, and once you've got it, you've got to format it a bit, and that's when you start your analysis. And we'll be talking about ways in which we can find data, ways in which we can format the data, and not ways in which we can analyze data for free. That's something that we'll start on the next session on us. Now, if you want to find data, the easiest way is to ask if someone knows where it is. It's probably going to be the quickest way of getting the data. Or you could search for it. I imagine most of you would do a Google search or search through any special questions <coughs> that you may have access to. Or you could crawl the data. Now, this is the term for pulling data off of multiple web pages. That's what crawling is, that's what most search engines do to every page. And you could do something similar. If, for instance, you have a series of tables sitting on a website, then you could just go to each page one by one, copy and paste the data into Excel and get the data. So that's the manual version of crawling. If you wrote a program to do that, that would be a program that would be doing your crawling. Or uh, and associated with that is scraping. Scraping is the part where when you paste it into Excel, it recognizes that it's a table and puts it into a structure. Uh, if it were an HTML table and you opened, let's say, Internet Explorer or Google Chrome and copied and pasted that table into Excel, it will recognize it as a table, which is fine. Sometimes the data isn't in the form of a table. Uh, it's just all over the place. It's maybe a list of items. So if you had say a list of movies, uh, the first line may be the movie title, the second line may be the director's name, the third line may be the list of actors, the fourth line may be uh, the year of release, and then the next line will be the next movie. So it's not quite the same kind of structure. So you have to convert it into a format that is more usable, more structured, and that's part of what scraping does. You could do this manually, line by line, or you could try it out. Uh, lastly, sometimes data is available through an API. An API is an application programming interface, uh, which really means that there's a program sitting at the other end saying, uh, tell me how you want the data, tell me what data you want, and you send it a request, it will get you the data back in a structured form. <coughs> Examples of data sources from where you can get uh, structured data uh, with relation to the projects, for example, you could get Twitter data this way. You could say, give me all the tweets that contain the word India in the last 24 hours. As the tweets come up, tell me who are all the people that are tweeting with an iPhone. As and when they come, just give me the data. Uh, or you could query the Internet Movie Database and say, give me all the movies between 1970 and 1990 that begin with the word the and do not have uh, <coughs> or uh, are not in the English language. These are things that an API would support. A database is a classic form of an API. You use SQL, which is structured language, structured query language that you use to query databases. So if you've got data in a database, that's an easy way of extracting it. These are roughly in increasing order of structure. When you ask somebody, the data that you are likely to get is possibly the least structured when you go to the API, the data that you get is likely to be the most structured and the rest varying levels of linear structure. If the data is perfectly structured, you don't really have to do much to format it. Uh, it's in the form that you want. The data that you get uh, could be in any of many forms. It could be a book, in which case you'll have to potentially scan it and after scanning it, use OCR to recognize it, which is a somewhat tough problem even in English. And outside of that, it's, it's a lot tougher. Uh, or it could be the form of PDFs. PDFs are slightly better in the sense that at least you can copy and paste text. You don't have to recognize the text, but it's still far from being structured because if you try copying and pasting a table from Excel, you uh, sorry, uh, copy and pasting a table from a PDF file into Excel, you wouldn't necessarily get the same structure that you want. There are ways around it, slightly painful, but at least it's, it's a step ahead of uh, having to scan a book. Or the data could be in HTML, which is slightly better. Uh, HTML is slightly more structured than a PDF in the sense that we can analyze its internals. We can copy and paste from HTML and put it next and it generally works fine. Uh, and even if it were not in the form of a table, it's possible to extract specific chunks of it and 
put in the structure we want. Excel files are even better. I use Excel files as a general terminology for any uh, tabular text uh, files. So these are files in which you have a series of rows and a series of columns and you know exactly what each cell represents. Columns have distinct meanings, the rows have distinct meanings. Uh, this is among the most structured forms of data that we get today. But even more structured would be data that you get in the form of a database. So if somebody said, here's a database, you can do all your querying on it, slice it any way you want, do the analysis explicitly in the database and work is so. So ideally you want data from these sources in these forms. You often get it in, from these sources in these forms towards the top. And this session is going to be about how do you automate some of this. Obviously there's no worry, uh, I mean, there's no point worrying about automating the bottom bits. There's nothing to automate, you already got it in the form you want. The top bits are rather tough. So we're going to start with the middle ground, which is, we're going to talk about how we can automate searching, crawling and scraping. We're going to talk about how we can automate getting data out of PDFs and HTML files. That's what we're going to try and cover. Let's start with the easy bits, uh, and I'm going to break this. Uh, this class will have two themes, or uh, sort of two uh, kinds of le lessons. One which could be done by the non-programmer, and the other which does require programming background. Some of you already have a programming background. Some of you have taken the Python course recently. Uh, some of you have not done either, and. Irrespective of this, some of the things that I will be covering today will go over your head. What I'm hoping is that at least there will be at least one thing today that none of you know, and hopefully, or not hopefully, but potentially at least one thing which none of you will understand as well. <laughs> but that's all right. You know, the aim is to cater to a, a very wide audience, and don't worry, therefore, if you don't get. Started. Uh, let's start with the simple bits. So how do we automate a search? Now let me rephrase the question. Let's say I am curious about whether uh, there is any new so any new whether there's any new mention of uh, the Mahabharata anywhere on the internet. Option one: wake up in the morning, do a Google search for Mahabharata, and go page after page and see if there's any anything that I haven't seen before. Okay. Assume that that's your worst case. And how does one improve this? Put the date. Google alerts. Google alerts. Subscribing to RSS speech would help. Let's walk through these. I'm going to start with a search for the Mahabharata. So the base option was do this every day and look to see if there's anything that's changed. Uh, now, given that the order in which it appears is the order of relevance, there's a good chance that the second day you'll see the same results, the third day you'll see the same results, and you'll have to go deep into the text to see if something new has emerged. And there are more search tools here. So the first thing that someone mentioned was use the data. I can just search for something that happened in the past hour, or something that was that changed in the past hour. So okay, somebody's talking about Kurukshetra in Loknath Maharaj talking for why the music.blogspot.com has an issue. And these are all things that happened in the last hour. Or you could expand that to the past 24 hours. So if you're looking at it every day, then this is a good option. You can see what's happening every day. And it's still a long list, but you can at least wade through it and know that these are things, these are pages that have changed in the last 24 hours. They may not necessarily be sites that have new information about the Mahabharata in the last 24 hours. For example, if somebody made a correction, if somebody changed an ad, if this was a long page in which people kept adding stuff. In all of these cases, they would be mentioned here, but there's not really any new information about the Mahabharata. So this isn't perfect, but it's a start. What it's doing is transferring the burden of identifying new pages onto Google, which is obviously far more efficient and great. Second thing something mentioned is using Google Alerts. <coughs> Who's used Google Alerts? That's less than half the class. Uh, <coughs> do a Google search for Google Alerts. And that shows you a site that says monitor the web for interesting new content, which is almost exactly what we're trying to do here. So if I search for Mahabharata, 
On the right, it shows me what it might return. I can filter by result type. I can say, I just want to be use for the hour, the or 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 or the 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 and another option that says feed. If I select an email ID and click on create another, I will get an email once a day. And the contents of the email will look like what I have on the right side. If I said feed, then there's no how often it's always as it happens. And a feed is what I'll be going to do in a short time. Let me create another and see what happens when you get this. Uh, okay, I've got a whole bunch of alerts. Uh, so, we have a link here that says open it in Google Reader. Google Reader is a feed reader, and a feed is uh, a feed is an alert mechanism. Except that instead of coming to your email, it comes to an application. Instead of coming to the email application, it comes to a different application called the feed reader. If and if you are already using a feed reader then this makes perfect sense. If you are not, uh, it's a great way of staying up to date with teams. How many of you are using free data? That's most people. Uh, for those of you who are not, Google Reader is a good place to start. That's reader.google.com or as always do a Google search for Google Reader. The other uh, application you might want to consider is Microsoft Outlook where you can add RSS feeds if you happen to be already using Microsoft Outlook. It's a good way of managing your <coughs> emails and feeds in the same place. Uh, Google Reader somewhat looks like uh, email. You've got a bunch of uh, folders and inside each folder you've got a bunch of uh, subscriptions. So in this particular case, uh, let's see, I've got a bunch, I've got a folder called data, inside which I've got a bunch of feeds. Uh, let me tell you. Uh, I've got this feed called GitHub SRM0. Now these are the last four alerts from the people that I'm watching on GitHub. GitHub is a site where you can share code. And there are four changes that are being made by people. So this is my alert. I can choose to go to what happened here, which is what we know on what changed. Uh, mark it as a red, or I can just choose to ignore the whole thing and mark them all as red. That's one way of managing feeds. Uh, now that we've created this feed for the Mahabharata, I can click on this thing and it automatically opens it in Google Reader. And it starts by saying welcome to the Google Alerts feed, I will receive, I will receive new alerts for everything, blah blah blah. The next time I visit Google Reader, there will be an unread item. And you assume I do that app 24 hours, there will be an unread item that says here's your next Google alert for Mahabharata. If there were new search results, if there were none, then it just wouldn't happen. There is another way uh, you might want to look at this. If you knew that there was a page that carry news about the Mahabharata and you just want it to be alerted every time that page changes. That's possible as well. You can set up an RSS feed or you can set up a feed that you can capture on Google Alert, or sorry, on Google Reader or on Microsoft Outlook. That's using a site called Page to RSS. Page to RSS, just a Google search. Page to RSS.com. Uh, if I know that the site uh, Let's take the Wikipedia page and I want to see if anyone's ever changing the Wikipedia page because that's possibly who's going to be your RSS. And this is now, uh, this link is now something that I can add to Google Reader or Outlook. I can copy it, go to Google Reader, click on subscribe, paste, add, and right at the bottom, I have the new entry 
which will keep getting updated anytime somebody makes an edit to the Mahabharata or the Wikipedia. So if you, if you have a source and they keep adding new sources to add the new information to that page, then it's a good way of track. Uh, what are the other examples of pages that we want, that we might want to track this way? Uh, <coughs> let's take the RBI site. If on the RBI site's home page or they have a publications page where they keep adding new publications and you want to know every time they do that. They do that sometimes, let's say every month, every week, whatever. You don't want to have to go to the site every time to check it. This is a way to do it. You also can aggregate across multiple sites. You go to your RSS uh, reader, you go, you go to your feed reader. You can see changes for any site, uh, be it changes on Mahabharata, be it changes on your Wikipedia article on earthquakes, the RBA site, whatever. Think of it as your inbox for any news or any kind of things. This is one way of automating search. What I'm not going to talk is the next way of automating search, which is uh, you don't need to type in a search in the first place. Google provides a search API, which means that you can write a program, say, and send in the query Mahabharata, and it would return the top results for the Mahabharata, sorted in various ways. You can say, just give me the new results for a day. So you can write a program that does it. What you need to do to learn more about this is search for Google Search API. Yahoo offers a similar API, Bing offers a similar API. You can pick pretty much any search engine. Do a search for Search API and go ahead and use it, assuming you want to do some programming with this. I'm going to try out one exercise. See, let's say you've got some data. You want to process this data because it's not quite in a clean form, it's not quite formatted. Form. An example that I'm going to take is movie ratings data. This data is available from the Internet Movie Database. Let's do an exercise where we take this data and find out and try to answer the question Have the ratings of movies improved over the years? So, first thing to do is figure out <coughs> where this data is. Um, let's try a query. I want a query that tells me where I can find the Internet Movie uh, Database's list of movie ratings. What query do you suggest I type first? Internet. Movie database. Ratings database. Sorry, ratings database. Ratings database. Mm -hmm. Comedies. Comedies. Nine. Nine. Okay. So, where should I go? First. First. Okay. First. okay. I keep scrolling. If you spot anything, let me know. Or if you want me to search for something, let me know. Top to fifty. Okay. Would you be able to make an attempt at answering the question? Mm -hmm. Not at all? No, yes. You have to you the years. Take the years. Take the years. Sort it according to the years and the mm -hmm. ratings. Sort it the years and ratings. Okay. If there are more than one, take the average. If there's only one, take the average. Compare, compare it. Let's do that. Let's try and do that. So, first, the, the one way, of course, of doing it is doing it by hand. Obviously, this is not what we are going to do. Uh, do you think I would be able to copy and paste this into Excel? Yes. Yeah. After I've kept the mouse exactly where I want, press shift, it selects up to there. It's a useful trick for selecting across multiple pages. Control C to copy, or right click and copy to copy. Go to Excel, paste, and I've got something. Now we need to extract the movie name. So, the first thing I do is Make this a little wider so that I can see the full name and the title instead of it being wrapped up. This looks a bit ugly. So first thing to do that for that is uh, okay. I'm used to the shortcut keys. I'm not entirely sure how to get it. Uh, right click format sets, and there's an alignment section where it says wrap text, and we'll remove that wrap text. Uh, all of these are on the same line. And I can increase the width and the choose width or decrease it. Now we've got to extract the year. How do we do that? Sort on the year. Separate the year into a different column and then the year is on a column. On Excel, we have content for a problem. Splitting the uh, that particular cell. Bracket start. Okay, so there is a bracket start, split it. 
because only the exact information on the right side. Okay. Any other? So you get it in another column and uh, so you can get on another column. Let's walk through both approaches. <laughs> you were saying convert the columns. Convert that is sent text to columns. Right. Using what separator? Sorry? Using what separator? Open this and the break. Open this. Open this. Okay. So we're talking about the same. Now what if there were a movie that had brackets in its title? Is there a way of avoiding? So yes. Uh, now this is a list of 250 movies. Yeah. Starting with number. Sorry, starting with. Uh, start. I mean the within the. Okay. So you have to say open bracket starting with the number. Now that's not possible using Excel. convert Excel's convert columns. Uh, there might be a few of you who are not following this dialog. Don't worry about it. I'm going to go through this step by step. Okay. Uh, so that is not possible with Excel. Yeah, the way we can check on the right hand, find the right most bracket. Find the right most bracket. And find the next closing bracket with that. And, and then close it. Because yeah. it's a little bit of programming. Uh, yes, use of functions. Yeah, that's effectively requiring the use of functions. Now, it also appears that the movie name is always the last. Yes. Sorry, the years yeah. are always yeah. the last. The good part about the year name is that it's always four numbers or digits or four numbers. characters and the last character is always a close bracket so if we take the last but five characters and ignore the last one which is always going to be the closing bracket we should have the year but let's walk through these approaches one by one <coughs> the first approach was let's split it into our columns using text to columns now i can select any column and go to data text to columns and this allows me to select uh, to break up this one column into multiple columns using different approaches. I can say that it's I want to break up wherever there is a delimiter. In this case, a delimiter could be an open bracket. So let's try that. I can say other put open bracket as a delimiter. It gives me a preview of what this looks like. And so far things seem fine. There isn't a third column. But the top 250 movies keep changing, and there is, in fact, there have been times when the bracket has been part of a movie name. So, while this works, there's no guarantee that it will work in the future, but we will try this out as well. Okay, and then we'll see what kind of fallacies or problems we have with the approach. I'm going to click on finish. At this point, it's supposed to create a new column, but you might be wondering where are you going to put the new column? I've got column C, because you're going to overwrite column D. Uh, let's see what it says. It says you want to replace the contents of the destination sets, which in this case is column D. Uh, I'm not really fussed about the votes. I don't want the votes, I'm only looking at the ratings. So in this particular case, I'm going to say okay, but what you may have wanted, have wanted to do is insert a black column between C and D so that it doesn't overwrite that, or move column C to the so it's overwritten, and what I have here is something that looks like the year, except there's a closing bracket there. Let's remove the closing brackets. How do I do that? Use the function write, write function. Okay. okay, two approaches. Somebody said find and replace. Somebody said use the write function. I'll come to the use of functions in a while. Both are valid approaches. In this particular case, search and replace is probably going to be easier because they just have to select the column. Press Close bracket till nothing and delete it all. That's very fast. Now, if you, I don't know if you noticed, let, let, let me do that. <coughs> the replace, the closing bracket, uh, and say replace all. It pops a message saying it has made 249 replacements. There should have been 250. Which is an indication that something is wrong. In this case, it just turned out to be me having made a keyboard mistake. <coughs> I accidentally appeared to have copied time below. So I'll just do a few undoes until that gets sorted out. Uh, or if it doesn't get sorted out, I'll just go back to the table, find out when the shorthand redemption goes against. And then I go close bracket. And select the column again, replace all closing brackets with a black. Replace one. So now it's made to be replacements. 
accidentally gives you a message saying this is what happens, how many rows are affected by your three days and whether you filter, etc. So you will work doing a quick check to see if that's happened or not. To the right Is this fine? Do we now have everything we need? Let's go through this list. And then if you spot any abnormalities. There's a comma after. There's a comma, yes. Okay. I don't know if you're able to see this, but uh, no, sure. okay, let me get it. <coughs> this says 2011 slash I. IMDB sometimes <coughs> finds movies with the same title in the same year multiple times. In which case it says this is the first movie that was released that year, the second movie that was released this year, and so on. So how do we get rid of that? One possibility would be to say if it's always going to end with slash something, we could just take the first four letters. The other possibility is to say let's do text to columns again with slash as a delimiter this time and move it to the next column. There are many other ways. I'm going to do text to columns again. Then data, text to columns, delimiter, other one is slash and finish. Now this new column E ought to have the I or the I I or whatever. So we've got that in row 155, we've got that in row 180, which was the artist, we've got that nowhere oh, else. We've got two movies. But now everything out here ought to be a number. And now we can do the analysis. Just out of curiosity, almost. Uh, now we need to get the, let's say we just want to see which decades have the best ratings. So getting the decades is fairly easy. Take the first three digits. Yeah. Take the third digit alone. Uh, that would almost, but in this case it would work. It would get confused between, for instance, 1910 and 2010. So you want to take the first three, mm. not, you know, I mean, there were enough movies released in 1910 for us to want to value what it. That's not on this list, but uh, you would want to factor that in. So, okay, first three digits. Any other way? Divide by 10 and multiply by 10. Divide by 10 and multiply by 10. That's a possibility. In fact, if you just divide by 10, that provides the same result as well. Both are valid approaches. So I could say decade is this divided by 10. And now I need to round it off to the nearest number. So I can, I can use the round formula flow, which will get me the lowest number. And copy that formula down. So, or I could use the left function, which gives me the first three characters, and I get the same result. It doesn't matter which one. So, let me copy both these formulas. And now comes the question what was the average rating by decade? For each decade, we want to calculate what the average rating is. Group it. We want to. Add the table. Yeah. Take the, the ratings. Add it and divide by the number of them. Okay. So sort it by yes. the decade and manually do the calculation for each decade. That's another option. Let's try those in the reverse order. Uh, let's sort this by decade. Okay. You, you just sort of go to data and click on sort. Uh, sort by decade. So, sort numbers and take. So there was there were things in 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, and so on. Now let's see how I calculate the averages. So if I want to add them up, why bother doing a sum form? I can just <clears throat> select the ones that I want. So up to 1992, that's an average of 8.18. So 1920s, that's 8.18. Then 8 and then I go to the next one, which is 93 onwards, uh, uh, up to here, so that's 8.21. So 1930s is 8.21, and so on. There's probably a last one. Okay, come back. Like what we did, uh, as you're doing one decade, you could build in, I don't know, like a function which could say that compare at the greater one decade. And you could do something with functions. Uh, now we probably don't even need to go as far as functions. They are fast way of doing it, just pure pages. So let me let's do a table on the menu. 
Insert. 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 And it automatically selects the data set that we want. Click on OK. What we want is by decade. So I'm going to move that to the rows and ask for the RMG. I'm going to move that to the values. Now it's giving me the sum of all of these. So what I wanted was the average of those. So I can use this drop down, go to the <coughs> settings, select average. And now it gives me the average of all of these. I just want two decimals, so let's go home. I actually need one decimal. I'm talking two decimals. Now, <clears throat> the easiest way to figure out which of these is large or small is to use a little in cell bar chart like this. So clearly the 1990s have the best rated movies for the 1970s. At least as for the top 250 movies. Now, what if we did this same analysis? With the full data set. The process is almost exactly the same. What takes the time is getting the list of movies. Okay, one option is to write a program to scrape it and stuff like that. But uh, your best option really is to ask somebody how to get this data set in this particular case. I will tell you that there is IMDB supports the raw data download. Data download. Let's just try that. I know you are but just trying to go through the process. The first thing that it provides is imdb.com slash interfaces which describes alternate ways to access IMDb locally by holding copies of the data directly <coughs> on your system. <coughs> Let's click on that. It takes us to a bunch of sources from where you can get the plain text files. I'm going to click on the Swedish link. This is usually... Now the list of ratings for all the movies happens to be in a file called ratings.list.gz which is a 7.6 MB file. You can download it. I've already downloaded it. And I'm going to open that file. Here's where this file is. You can unzip it. I've already unzipped it. Now I'm going to open the same set. Ratings.list. Now when I open a file like this, it asks me, and this is a text file. So I said recognize that it's a text file, but it's not formatted, and therefore it does it asks you to be equal to the text columns. The structure of the file is somewhat different from the other files. It's got some initial description. In fact, it's got a full fledged email at the beginning describing all of this how the RAM is computed, how the formula is computed, and so on. But then, after a while, the movie details start. In this case, I'm not going to split it by a separator. There's no separator between the columns. Instead, these are all of a fixed width. So there is another way in Excel of using. Fixed weights to separate columns. That's just edit fixed width. This is very easy to use actually. Once you select fixed width and click on next, it, uh, it allows you to position these vertical bars wherever you want to split the columns. You can drag them around a bit, so which makes it fairly intuitive. And once you've done that, just click on finish. This takes a while. It's a rather large file book, 22 MB and zip. So once it's done, there's one. Uh, how large a file can you open in Excel? 16 million rows is one minute constraint that Excel imposes. So if your file has to be less than 16 million rows. This one is, I think, less than a million rows. Uh, how many columns? It has to be less than 65,000 columns. Uh, that's the second limit. There is also a restriction on the total number of cells. I don't offhand remember what it is. But uh, there's a good chance that if you have a file that hits either one of these limits, you're already looking at a file that's, uh, I mean, if, if it comes near these limits, you're looking at something that is going to be relatively slow and be processed, you know, when you process it on Excel. So it might not be worth the effort. What I've found is generally, at least people's opinion of what Excel can open is a lot lower than what it really can open. So as a good rule of thumb, just open it in Excel. You'll find that it's faster than you might have thought. This rule of thumb works for most people that I know, including myself. I didn't think this file was going to open in Excel until this morning when I tried it. But it's open. And now we have one. Uh, here's where the, the good stuff starts. I'm going to delete everything about that. And towards the end, it's got a footer of some kind of a delete. Oh, that's, that's just the top of the things. Okay. Uh, yeah. 
Here we have a Buddhist of the star. And right at the bottom, for the great cosmos, goes, beyond this, there's some stuff that I don't care about. Maybe that as well. And now you've got these 420,000 rows, uh, which have a list of pretty much all the movies. And we have the same problem as before, which is the movie, the year of the movie is in brackets. So let's do the same thing as before, which is kind of this using text to columns. But now, for sure, we're going to have a problem. Because there will be movies with brackets, can't use that. And it's not just that, sometimes these movies end with an open bracket P, so I can't even be sure that it's the last uh, four characters. So one possibility is to go through all of these, remove everything that ends with P. With Will that always be in the year? Maybe, maybe not. Then we'll always find. This has got a B at the end. So maybe I can remove everything that has a B or a TV at the end. Possible. To the best of that, okay, that doesn't quite do it. Uh, so BG, that's another one. But the good part is, uh, if you go through this data set, you won't find more than maybe half a dozen types of things that have this at the end. And the numbers aren't too large either. So you can say, look, I'm not interested in a perfect analysis. I don't care if the difference between one decade and another is 0 0.32 or 0.33. I just want to know which is the biggest. So, let's do a quick inventory analysis. This actually is extremely important. And there's this uh, video on YouTube, a uh, TED talk, called Street Fighting Mathematics. You want to take a look at this. You definitely want to take a look at this. We what covered it later in the course. Oh, okay. yes. Sorry, it's going to be the course. Uh, part of what stops us from doing stuff is the inability to do it the right way. But what's most important <coughs> for often is getting some result which is a roughly accurate and relationally true, which helps us go forward. You don't want the answer. You don't want the right answer every time. You just want to be able to take a step forward, not get stuck. In this particular case, I'm going to say, I don't care about these TV things. I just don't care. I'm going to ignore all of them. What am I going to do? I'm going to take the last four characters. Uh, equals, I'm going to take the last five characters. The right of this card. Right? That's often the moon. And then I'm going to take the, I'm going to ignore the close bracket in that using the left function. I'm going to take the first four. I could have done this in other ways. Those of you who have experts on Excel formula, I'm sure you can find other ways of doing it. Uh, and I'm copy this on, drag this down to fill this. And so that's good enough. And what do you do? Now, obviously, this. <coughs> Obviously, some of these are not yours. That's fine. That is not this. For now, that's good enough. Let's see what kind of results you get. And this is important because once you get a sense of the results, you'll know if the direction in which you're progressing is being. <coughs> this process that we're following is effectively the equivalent of ignoring all videos, TV shows, and so on. Structurally, that's what it is equivalent to because we're ignoring anything that has a B or a T or a VG at the end of it. That's fine. We are just interested in the ratings for movies, not TV shows. Let's do the same thing we did before. Uh, let's get a decade. And divide this by 10. Now, the good part about dividing by, oh, sorry, not by divide by 10. I've got to, uh, the, let me take the first three characters in the decade. I'm taking the first three characters instead of the first four characters. So I straight away got the decade instead of having to go to the year in the first place. Once this is done, let's do a pivot table. In which I place the decade. And now I have the back. And I get the average of the back. All of these I want to ignore. So I'm going to pick the row labels and say I don't care about anything except where they are, they look like you know, 1900s or 2000s or whatever. There's a lot of junk here, no idea where these came from. But let's just ignore all of those and only focus on the ones that start with. Uh, so that could be a year 1910, uh, now 2.0, uh, 200, 201, 2020 and August. 
This is one way of doing this. There are other smarter ways of doing it as well. Like, for instance, you could say, I only want to filter those where the number of movies was at least a thousand. In any, in any decade, if there were a thousand movies, then I would send that a decade or something that's either too long ago or too far in the future. But anyway, so I've got the average of the ranks. And let's do the same thing that we did last time. Firstly, let's get rid of this many decimals and let's add the bar, ch bar charts. Looks like the 1920s were a So we had a, a good time with movies in the 1920s. And then things started getting worse until the 2000s when things started getting better. And 2010, things in this decade, things are looking even better. So pretty much only in the last 20 years, it, it's been a continuous decline for cinema for the last 20 years. And now things have started looking on. That didn't take too long. We could have gotten stuck with that VG, V, whatever the inaccuracies for a long time. I bet you, when you actually do the analysis, the results will not be any different, at least from a, from a navigate perspective. It won't make any significant difference to the conclusion. Just a couple of things that I wanted you to take away from this. Using minimal formulas and using Excel. You can do a fair bit of processing with text-based data, probably much more than you can think. That includes a volume of data. Excel probably can handle a lot more than you think it can handle. Second thing I want you to take away is try to get to the results quickly. It doesn't matter how rough they are, how approximate they are. Start with one version of the results and then worry about whether you need to get a better version of the results. Quite often you may find that your hypothesis is completely rejected right up front. You may find that you have more interesting analysis that you might want to follow more, or you might just run out of time and have to turn in the submission right then. Get the first iteration of as quickly as you can, and then you can be able to go in if that's required. That's what I want to cover in this example. Let's take a short break, maybe five minutes, and when we come back, we'll be going through programmatic examples where we'll be crawling data as well as scraping the data.